recognize this robot as an image from the movie Terminator. Science fiction has cultivated fear that an AI will take over and ultimately lead to our untimely demise. My message is simple. Robots will help humanity. So for our live audience, the human-robot dance duet that we just watched is incredibly moving, but this robot does not fall into the section of artificial intelligence. And it is because it was programmed exactly to have very specific movements, and those movements were carried out just as it was programmed. In this way, it's acting more as a machine rather than an intelligent entity. So, for something to qualify as artificial intelligence, it has to be capable of learning. For over 300 years, the word computer was used to describe humans carrying out calculations. And it wasn't until about 80 years ago with modern-day digital computers that we started to use the word computer as describing a machine carrying out a calculation. Now we're entering the age of artificial intelligence, where machines are capable of learning. So there's two main subsections of artificial intelligence. One is software, and the other is hardware. So software is going to be line-by-line -line code, and essentially what it does is it takes a system and allows for training from a data set. This is the learning process. And then it goes a little bit further, and in this area, it's allowed to make classifications or predictions depending on what the task is. Hardware AI, on the other hand, is a physical chip capable of learning, and it follows the same exact process as the software does. It should definitely note that Software AI is all over the internet. All the major companies are already using it. Hardware AI, however, is being researched by all the major companies. I have been working on hardware AI the last five years, and a great example of software AI is self-driving cars. So 1.3 million people die every year in automobile accidents and 20 to 50 million people are disabled or injured. This is the number one leading cause of accidental death in the world. So, <laughs> self-driving cars are the future. They will never have a lapse in intention. They will never fall asleep, never drive drunk or recklessly they will virtually remove automobile accidents as a cause of death. So we can see that software AI is going to save lives. And now the question is, can AI help save our environment? Growing up in Washington State on the coastline, I have an extreme love of nature, and it's very important to me to give back to the world that we live in. So it turns out hardware AI will lead to robots that are able to work in real time, on site, and determine, say, a cigarette is a piece of trash, but leave a piece of driftwood where it is. On top of this, we have plastic piling up in the oceans, and eventually, we're going to have massive ocean bots that will pick up plastic and leave fish alone. Also, we have drones. But using AI software called Swarm Intelligence, modeled after birds and bee movement, we can quickly map out oil spills and then deploy sea drones to clean these up. And this is a much cleaner alternative than current oil spill techniques. So the real question is, why can't we just use standard computers for this? And there's two main problems with standard computers. So number one, you have a separation of memory and processing. And this space between it causes a limitation of information transfer. 
Number two, the elements in your phones and computers today are so small, we can't really make them much smaller. So we're, we're hitting the limit of standard computer architectures. So we need an alternative architecture. We want to combine this memory and processing into the same platform. And we want it to be super, super low power. So if we look to nature as an inspiration, it turns out the human brain does just this. Very low power, combining memory and processing. We are able to store memories and solve complex problems. And this is done by electrical signals flowing through neurons in the brain, which are highly interconnected and densely packed. So my group has sought to do just this. Starting with a standard chip, if we zoom into this red box, we can see platinum electrodes, and these are just here to monitor electrical activity. From here, another zoom in, we put down tiny, tiny little seed sites. And from these little seeds, we put them in a solution, and atom by atom, these seeds are traded out and self-assembled to create an incredibly dense interconnected network, very similar to the human brain. We get about a billion connections per square centimeter when we make these. Not only that, every single chip that we grow is going to be incredibly different from the last, just like everyone's brains are different from each other's. But they have similar density and similar properties, and have long-range connections, short-range connections, and it turns out, this is a zoom in of the last photo, if you look at every place that a nanowire crosses another nanowire, they can build up atom by atom and form these tiny filaments, and this is a switch. And if the filament is very thin, we call that short-term memory. And if it's very thick, we call it long-term memory. So just like in the mammalian brain. And standard computers today are more like a switch. It turns on and then it turns off. Um, there's no range of the connection there. So I'm going to leave you guys with an image of actual human neurons. They are highly interconnected, and you can see they do look pretty similar to some of the networks that I've grown. So with this, I would like to ask you, given the potential benefits to society and the environment, please don't be afraid to say yes to AI. Thank you. <laughs>